Very good. Okay. Um, so my name is Lydia Bunting, and I'm currently a master's student at Texas Tech University studying atmospheric science. Um, so this summer I worked with um, Ryan and Drew mostly addressing the MetPi 1.1 milestones um, as that was being prepared for to be rolled out. Um, so for this presentation specifically, I'm going to be kind of mostly just talking about kind of that process and then a little bit more specifically on code verification and just the different testing that it undergoes before it's merged with the rest of the project. Um, before I get started, some quick acknowledgements. Um, first, um, thank you to Unidata and UCAR just for this opportunity to be involved with this internship over the summer. It's been a really good experience and I've definitely learned a lot just about all the different components that go into software development and how it applies to weather. Uh, thank you also to Ryan May and Drew Cameron for their guidance and support throughout the summer. And thank you also to Connor and Izzy, um, the other interns, for this. Our collaborative time is always a lot of fun, and it's just nice to have other people to be doing this with. Um, so although most of you have an idea of what MetPy is, um, here's just a quick overview of that. Uh, MetPy is essentially just a collection of tools in Python that is used for understanding weather data. Um, through calculations, visualiz visualizations, and other functions. Um, um, the IPS project is um, supported by the National Science Foundation, and its primary use is for meteor meteorological research um, and understanding of the atmosphere by simulating um, different functions, reading data, and then plotting. Um, these are just some examples of what MetPy can be used for, um, things like plotting time series data as a mediogram, as is seen to the right. Um, and it also can be used to plot a collection of data on a map using X-ray or Cartopy, as is in the example below. Um, these are only a few things. Um, as you saw in Connor's presentation especially, MetPy can be used for a wide variety of applications and things. Um, so, most of my work this summer has been dedicated to understanding and addressing some of the different milestones and things to be done before the 1.1 update. And so these milestones are essentially code enhancements or bug fixes that want to be addressed before the new update. Um, they're introduced in GitHub as these various issues that are brought to the attention um, of the GitHub by different users or its different developers. Um, and they basically are just the different ways that it is desired to function that is not currently functioning. Um, so I studied a few of these different issues throughout the summer, but the one that took up the majority of my time and was the first one I looked at was issue 1844. Um, for this issue, uh, it was had to do with mapping and plotting. And essentially, the issue was that the climate and forecasting output from PyProj, which is the Python interface to the cartographic projection and coordinate transformation library, um, wasn't being accepted by the function that is used to assign a coordinate reference system to the data, which is that MetPy assign CRS. Um, this problem was initially fixed in the issue by adding an attribute for the Earth's radius to the input directory for that part of the code. However, after this initial fix was implemented, a new problem emerged in the code, and that is mostly what I looked at. And this issue, or the new problem, was that the latitude of the projection center um, was missing in the climate and forecast listing after this new um, value of the Earth's radius was given. Essentially, the value of latitude zero was lost in the um, projection. And that resulted in some incorrect projections and general missing data. And the cause of this was that when converting from the initial coordinate projections and the climate and forecasting projections, the attribute of inverse flattening was given a value of zero. And this attribute is a measure of the compression between the sphere as it was converted to an ellipsoid. And being a value of zero, it kind of broke some of the other functionality of the code. So in order to fix this issue, the code was rewritten um, so that if the value of inverse flattening was zero, um, it was interpreted instead as a spherical datum. It was not passed on through the remainder of the code. And a spherical datum is just a reference point that defines the position of um, a location or part of a map. And 
just allows it to be a fixed point and, and it doesn't affect other things going forward. Um, this is part of that code that was used to fix it, essentially just an if statement where if the case occurred where in was flattening the zero, um, it would pass it on and not, or it would use it as a datum and would not pass it on to the rest of the code. And so it wouldn't impact later functioning as it tried to map and plot things. So after this code was changed, um, before it could be implemented into the rest of the project, it had to go under O code verification. Um, and this is basically just to ensure that the code is working as it expected. Um, and it's, it was done on my part through unit testing, which um, is just a piece of code or a test code that activates a piece of the system to ensure it behaves as expected by developers. Um, it's called unit testing because it starts the smallest components of the code first and then works um, line by line and increasing in size until all of the code has been tested to ensure it's all integrating correctly and is working as expected. Um, so the goal of code, verif code verification is to isolate each part of the program and show that it is correct um, and that is operating as it is expected to by the person who wrote the code. Um, and the reason this is so important is that um, the process of a code verification early on identifies problems as the code is developed rather than allowing them to go undetected and potentially affect the rest of the code. Um, second, the process of code verification ensures that code developers are thoroughly thinking through the code that they write and that they understand how it's functioning. Um, third, um, neglecting tests and the code verification process can lead to code that is broken or ineffective or um, inadvertently affects other parts and just generally can lead to problems with users, which is generally not wanted for these type of things. Um, so as for the issue that I was addressing, issue 1844, um, I had to write a test code to activate the new code that I added. Um, for this issue, that was just introducing the case where inverse flattening is zero. Um, so I basically just um, gave in the attributes for to establish the sphere and then added in the case where inverse flattening was zero. So it would activate that if statement and not pass on that inverse flattening value, but instead just interpret it as a reference point. And this test did pass. And so that meant that the code written to address this issue was operating correctly. Um, so after the GNU code has been tested and is operating, operating as expected, the next step is to integrate the code and its changes with the rest of MetPy. And this is done by submitting a pull request through GitHub. Um, once this pull request is submitted, um, the code undergoes um, further tests that are mostly automated um, that run through all the code, see how it works with the rest of the code and ensure that it's complying to um, style standards and is adequately um, behaving the way it's expected to, as well as working well with the rest of the code. Um, and just basically um, going further than the manual tests can go. Uh, once these automated tests are done, um, the code undergoes further manual review uh, by staff. And then once it meets all of the standards necessary and is behaving appropriately, then it is then merged with the rest of MetPy. Um, this flowchart just shows an overview of that process of identifying an issue with MetPy functionality. Um, and then once that issue is picked up by a developer, that developer then determines the cause of the issue, um, then determines a potential fix and writes code to fix or address that issue. Um, they then write tests to verify that their code is working as expected. And once they have tested their code thoroughly, they can then submit a pull request so that um, the automated tests can be run. Um, and in the case that there are issues with their pull request or their code, they go back um, and address the issues identified in the pull request tests. And these two steps, submitting a pull request and addressing, addressing issues that are identified in the automated tests are repeated until all the tests pass and the code can be merged. Um, so in summary, um, code verification is very important in as part of software development to make sure that all the code is um, be, um, behaving the way it's supposed to and working well with the rest of the code and so that it's not breaking or losing functionality. 
um, it's very important to complete this process because failing to perform code verification can lead to broken code or lack of functionality in the program as a whole. And this is especially important for a program like MetPy that is being used for a wide variety of applications and by a wide variety of users. Um, and primarily because broken code can have um, an impact on potentially their user experience or their research and just generally lead to trouble along the way for the users. Um, so that is, thank you. And um, I've really enjoyed this internship experience and I'll now take any questions. I can also show my poster for tomorrow. Oops. Hey, Lydia, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I do have a question. With regard to, so you have touched to uh, uh, the testing part. So how much uh, coverage was there in the MetPy in general? Percentage um, of test coverage. Yes, yeah. So that, the test that I wrote was integrated with part of a much larger file that tests the entire file that I was working with, the mapping.py. Um, and so it tested basically um, a bunch of different um, projection coordinate systems to ensure that when the coordinate system or projection system was changed, it would still behave correctly even with different dimensions or things like that. Um, it also tested um, like with if it was a sphere or an ellipsoid um, and then just some different things based on the way that those can behave in it as well. And to, to your direct question, Mustafa, we're at about 96% test coverage on MetPy, but unfortunately we don't have every permutation of all the possible sets of metadata we can get from NetCDF files tested. And that's kind of where, where this was hiding. Yep, thank you. Yeah, because uh, Lydia, you mentioned uh, that uh, those uh, uh, the MetPy as a library is being used by a lot of people, researchers and students, and so on. So, and uh, having some uh, flaws into the, those different uh, 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 different libraries and functions that being called for whatever reason, you know, uh, to add to their own research work. Uh, so if they if they uh, come across something that doesn't work, then it's uh, really bad on uh, on the library itself, right? So that's why uh, that's that's where my uh, question stems from. Hi, Lydia. I have sort of a related question. Nice presentation, thank you. Um, my question is is more about your own process as a developer, um, and if you could maybe describe for us how you go about developing a unit test, how it fits into that larger framework that, in this case, MedPy has a, a big framework of tests that get run every time you submit a PR. But you have to start somewhere. And I'm curious, you know, maybe what you learned about that over the course of the summer and, and working on these particular issues. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely something new to think about. Because like I'd heard about unit testing before, like in computer science classes, but I've never really had the need to do it because I've never been using code that's used for more than like a single one-off class project or something. So I think it was really, really interesting to just read through all the codes that like the tests that had already been written and see just how thorough they were at addressing what really like the name defines as a unit test, like how precise it goes to like the smallest parts of the code and making sure that those are working for progressing to the larger ones. So that's really what I focused on with writing my own was making sure it was starting very small before moving on to larger ones to make mm -hmm. sure that there weren't any like cascading errors or anything like that. Well, I got a question. So the uh, uh, the modelers are using a uh, spherical Earth? Some of them, it seems like. It's one of the conditions, I guess, that can be there. Hmm. I have a similar problem with uh, the UD units and the calendar that's in there. They insist on using a calendar with 365 days, 365 days in a spherical Earth. Get around it all up. Yeah. The question you were trying to ask before a lot of people's internet 
died. Do you want to ask that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I guess. Um, I was just going to ask uh, Lydia about the unit tests. And right before my internet dropped out, Doug had asked the question. And you had mentioned exceptions. And I was just wondering if you wrote any unit tests uh, with the purpose of failing and making sure that they fail gracefully or fail the way that you expect them to. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had I did not do that for this particular one, but it's something I've heard of it is valuable to do. So I'll definitely for the future and things going forward, definitely yeah, the thing to remember to incorporate.